Hello everyone and welcome to my talk um, which is entitled More Than Weeds um, as part of Dr. Jenner's House Becoming a Scientist Discovery Day today. Um, so today what I'm going to talk about is um, what I call more than weeds, um, so it's urban plants and the plight of urban plants because I really think we should be taking more attention and giving more attention to them. So just a very brief um, idea of where the talk is going to go. Uh, first, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about the history of urban weeds. Um, then we will look at the diversity of urban weeds and how can you identify them, how can you um, start appreciating them. Um, then I'll have a look at how and what weeds can teach us um, if we start noticing them a bit more. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, pavement plants, urban plants. We often think about them as, as, as not particularly useful, uh, but do they have any use and, and you know, what, what are, is their contribution to the ecosystem, for example? And finally, where I want you to act. Um, and so my, my really, my message behind the More Than Weeds project um, is can we learn to live with those plants? So I'll go through the talk for about half an hour and then you're free to join me at 1.30 for a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions, just make a note of it um, after, uh, next to the video or just keep your question in mind and ask, ask it afterwards. Um, I look forward to hearing from you all. So first, a very brief history of urban weeds. So when we think about a city now, wherever you live in the world, our cities tend to be dominated by stone, by brick, by concrete. Um, so plants are usually restricted to the areas that we have chosen. So for example, a planter, a park, a container. But sometimes, you know, we see plants growing elsewhere, like here in, on a wall. Um, and in those places, plants tend to be considered as weeds. We, see, we, we say, oh, this is a weed, it shouldn't be there, because we have decided it. Um, so I've, I've, I thought, you know, where are cities always that way? Um, did we, you know, start weeding very early on, or is it quite a modern, a modern thing? Um, well, weeds became a problem when mankind started to grow and domesticate white plants. So if you want to grow, you know, food and fruit and vegetable, weeds are going to compete with those plants you don't you want to remove them um, and what happened as well is with migration you know people migrated around the world very early on when you think about homo sapiens um, so what happened is as, as you can see here plants spread around the world with people so people you know brought for example a lot of the plants that we have in europe now come from asia we think they are native but actually they've come very very early on um, through the um, human migrations and so plants started to spread around the world, becoming problems in some areas and, you know, becoming a food or, or, or just um, normal plants, you know, white flowers in, in, in others. Um, in cities, from books and historical records, for example, street names, sometimes you, you have a, a weed name or plant name in, in a street name. Um, we know that the streets were naturally filled with plants. Um, but we also know that whether it was in Roman or you know, Middle Ages or Tudor times, uh, weeding was actually already an activity um, and it tended to be undertaken by slaves or, or by women, as you can see here in that painting, women scrubbing very hard for, for plants to remove what plants are on the key. Um, in the 19th century, obviously people started to look for easier alternatives than using children or women. And so um, they started, you know, making concoctions with um, all sorts of chemicals like sulfur and lime to try and get rid of, of the weeds. As you can see here, there's a recipe given in, a, in an old book. Um, to some people, however, weeds were opportunities. And I just want to make a little digression um, with the, um, the engraving on, on the left. And this is called a man called the groundsel man. So groundsel is, is a plant which you'll see um, a little bit later in the talk. It's a very common plant on pavements and gardens. Um, and around London and probably around other cities in, in the UK, you had people, usually poor people, collecting that uh, groundsel from you know, um, rich people's gardens or from pavements. And they would sell it in the street. So you can see that guy, he's got a little basket on his back and he's selling it um, as food for um, birds. So Victorians, for example, had, uh, loved caged birds um, and the birds needed fresh food. So those people who would go around gardens, parks uh, and pavement would collect those plants um, and would give them 
uh, or sell them for very small amounts to rich people uh, for their birds. Um, so to some people, the weeds were actually an economic opportunity. But at the turn of the century, weed killers appeared. So chemicals which could, you know, destroy everything, as you can see here. Uh, bless my soul, not a weed to be seen. I mean, this was, you know, this was amazing um, when we had come from, you know, manual weeding and scrubbing. Um, so this happened, this, this appeared in the 1940s. And then later in the 1970s, um, a very common uh, chemical called glyphosate appeared. And glyphosate is, man, is, is, is great because you can just remove all the plants very easily. So when you, when you walk around the city, usually you'll see very, very few weeds or plants because they've been removed. And people say, you know, councils and, and even, you know, neighbours and things like that, they say all oh, the weeds are dirty and they make an area look neglected. Um, they attract pests like rats. Um, they also cause allergies, um, which is, you know, a valid concern in, in, um, in cities where you have a lot of people and potentially um, where the allergies quite, can be quite, uh, quite strong. And of course, some, some say, you know, weeds are ugly. Um, so this is a judgment, obviously. But are plants in cities making a comeback? Um, and this is something I, I wanted to point out as a result of, oops, as a result of the lockdown. Um, so as you, as you can see, um, earlier this year, because people, you know, were... Um, lockdown inside and also because um, many council staff st um, stopped praying, um, plants started to grow back on, on the pavement. So, I mean, on, on the right, this is in the UK, on the left, um, this is a picture of Rome, where you can see all the cobblestones which have got, you know, plants um, growing between them. So plants started making a comeback and people started to have a slightly different, you know, um, reaction to them. So how many just how many plants are there you know in in a city well i've, I've taken a, a um a plane pictures from plane here in in london and i just wanted to reflect about the number of different habitats that you can spot in this picture for example here you've got the riverbed um you've got private gardens which you know may have vegetable or fruit or be abandoned or that sort of thing then you've got a large pond um you've got an area of woodland um, and you've got a park which has got grassland and, and flower beds and things like that. So just in a, in a very small area, um, you, can, you can have very, very different habitats. Um, so the riverbed is, is um, salt water or partly salty water, for example. So you'll, you'll have different plants growing than in a, in a shaded woodland, for example. So and an another um, example of those is tree pits. Um, so the area at the bottom of trees, for example, um, is home to a very, very wide diversity of plants. Um, so for example, you can see here, we've got chickweed, um, we've got the very pretty um, sow thistle, which is um, a plant from the daisy family. Um, then we've got Oxford ragwort, um, another common, common plant. There are grasses as well, um, like here, you can see here the, um, the wall barley. Um, there are plants that we shouldn't be, you know, um, seeing in, in, in urban areas or we shouldn't expect to see in urban areas like rapeseed, um, which is more common in, in the fields, you know, in the countryside. Um, and also a very common plant like shepherd's purse um, and eastern rocket, which is an edible rocket. Um, and it's, um, it's uh, coming from the Mediterranean area, so it's not a native plant. Um, so just a very, you know, very small overview that gives you an idea of the diversity of plants that you can find in, in tree pits. So overall, we think that there is no you know, definite data and that flora is changing as well. But we think there are over 2000 plants, uh, plant species that grow um, on pavements, you know, in urban, in urban areas. Um, so it's quite enormous. Um, I've been, I'm often asked, you know, what are the most common plants? So I've tried to come up with a small list um, of what I think are the most common plants, um, at least, you know, in London. Uh, but if you live in a, in a, in a for example, in a seaside town, uh, you may have a slight different range of plants because of the salt um, and some plants are not tolerant of salt, for example. Or if you live in a higher altitude, um, some plants may not like the cold. So for me, these are the most sort of common uh, plants. And I think around the UK, um, it, it, it'd be quite, quite similar. So we've got a pelletor of the wall, which, as the name says, often grows on walls. Uh, ground saw, which I've mentioned to you earlier. Um, then we've got the pink flowers of Herb Robert, a very common plant uh, which have, uh, with a very distinctive smell. Um, shepherd's purse here on, on, the, on the right, on the left, 
um, has got this very um, distinctive little triangle fruit. And then we've got some new sow thistle, uh, which I showed you in the, in the tree pit. Um, chickweed, um, another plant that was quite um, useful bird as well, as the name says. Um, then we've got a cress. This is a really interesting plant. So it's called Arabidopsis thaliana. Um, and it's a very important plant for scientists around the world. So it, it, it's very small. It doesn't look like, you know, um, much, but it's a very important plant that has been um, used to study genetics and DNA around the world. Um, and, um, the bottom here, we've got red dead nettle. Uh, again, quite a pretty plant. This is usually where you'll find bumblebees because they absolutely love it. And finally, um, something that can be quite an annoying weed for some uh, gardeners, um, this is creeping wood sorrel. Um, and I know that some people don't like it because it, it tends to spread. It's got those little fruit that explode and spread all the seeds around. So they're quite, um, it's a pretty plant. It's also very attractive to bees, but some people don't like it because it's slightly, um, you know, in, invasive uh, in places. Um, garden plants can escape to, and this is an interesting example. So it's called Lobelia arenus. Um, and it's, it's a plant from South Africa. So this is its native environment on, on the left. Um, it's a plant that has been introduced, uh, it was introduced I think by the Victorians um, because it grows really well in containers, hanging baskets. So it tends to be a summer plant. Um, it dies back with the cold. However, it produces a lot of seeds and you know, around cities, um, especially around things like pubs, uh, because they've got hanging baskets, you may spot that plant. So I think it's quite, you know, extraordinary to think about the fact that a plant that comes from the mountains of South Africa is now very common on, on the pavements of, you know, our, our cities. Um, and it's got the same sort of environment when you think about it. Um, you know, so it's, it's rocky soil, um, not much water. So in, in, in the mountains, the plants will grow, for example, between cracks in the rock. So when you think about it, it's quite normal that these plants would, you know, feel at home in the cracks between a wall and a pavement. Um, so this is the sort of plant that you may, you know, be able to spot in your, in your cities. So weeds can teach us a lot of things. For example, they can teach us about the history of an area. Um, so I've taken a picture, a, a picture here of engraving um, of, you know, the trade with ships coming in from around the world. Um, and for example, we know that a lot of plants came to the UK through um, the trade in grains um, and also in, in wool, because in wool, you know, uh, animal wool, you tend to have a lot of seeds that get tangled within the wool. So when the wool gets, um, you know, on, on a key in, in a, a, a harbour somewhere in, in the UK, well, that, that seed may germinate and, you know, get established. So it can tell us a little bit about, you know, whether an area was used for a certain trade. It can tell us about the land use. Um, so for example, you know, some polluted soils, you may have a very specific type of plants growing. So you can tell, you know, what the soil holds and, and how the site was used before. It can tell us about architecture and that's quite fascinating. So when you walk in a city, you may see different plants in different parts of the city. And that's because, um, well, it can be, um, because the, the stone or the, you know, the, the material used for the wall mm. is different. So for example, it might be more limestone or it might be, um, you know, a different kind of, um, different kind of stone with a different um, chemical compounds. And that influences, you know, the type of plants that, that grow on that, in that area. It can tell us about climate change, as you will see, and also about invasion. So if you, if you look at how plants, you know, move around, then you may tell us, uh, you may be able to explain, you know, how invasion and work. So a little bit of history, for example, um, with the Rose Bay Widow Home. Um, so this is not a particularly rare plant, but what they discovered in London is that it thrived after World War II. Um, so it, it's a plant, um, here you've got a picture of an estate before it was, you know, built on in the 1950s in London. Um, and that estate, you know, there, there were carpets of it growing after the war um, as a result of the war. So they called it, um, you know, the, the bombweed, bombweed they called it as well. So this, it's another name for that plant, particularly in London. Um, so this is, you know, quite interesting. Um, plants are spread, you know, by anything. Um, so I've got a picture of one of my trainers here and where you can see little seeds that have, you know, stuck to it. Um, railway, sometimes you'll see a plant, um, you know, in one place and because of the train, it gets 
um, dispersed by the trains. Um, um, of course, you've got birds as well. Um, so for example, the, the opium poppy, which is um, showed here, um, is very often dispersed by birds because they love the seeds. Um, and also, you know, track tires, um, cart tires, um, which collect seeds in the countryside and get them, you know, in the city. So, I mean, on the left here, you've got rapeseed plants. This is, again, a typical plant of the countryside. You wouldn't expect it to see um, in London, um, but it was, it was there, you know, growing in, in central London. So it gives you an idea of, you know, how plants are moved around. Um, it's quite fascinating. And also, uh, bird seed. This is a last example. So if you've got a bird feeder, um, we, we, you know, botanists sometimes get calls of, of people saying, oh, I've got a bird feeder and I've got this strange plant growing behind or below my bird feeder. This is because the seed mixes sold for birds are often imported. Um, so they're imported from Asia or other parts of the world. Um, and so we think that about 400 species from around the world have been introduced to the UK that way. Um, and one example is, for example, the apple of Peru, which is quite a pretty plant, but tends to grow very big, very quickly. Our flora is changing. Um, so some plants are disappearing, others are increasing. Um, so this is on the left, it's called Jersey cudweed, and it's a rare and protected plant in the UK. But actually in London, it's really common. You'll, you'll see it in more and more, you know, streets. Um, so it's not particularly, you know, rare plant in parts of London. Um, and it's been increasing there as well. Um, another plant that has been increasing is the very cute and very, very tiny rue leaf saxifrage. Um, and again, this is a plant, you know, we don't exactly know why. Sometimes, you know, it has, you know, we need more research, more scientists to be able to, you know, understand how those plants are and how, how the distribution of those plants is changing. Could pavement plants help us study climate change? This is a very interesting question. So we've noticed so that some plants have been spreading and increasing. On the other hand, other ones tend to, you know, um, get less and less common. So could some of those become invasive in the future? And this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about this later, but really this is about, you know, why recording plants. If we don't know what's around, we won't be able to track how they change and how they spread around. Um, so recording those plants, knowing where they are, how they're spreading or disappearing is very important. Um, and this is an example here with water bends. So on, on the left, you've got the map from the 1980s and on the right, uh, a map now. So in about 30 years, this plant has really, you know, expanded its range. It's not native, it's not causing any problem, but we need to know where it is and how it's spreading because it, it can tell us a lot of things, um, you know, about, about how a plant spread, whether it might become invasive in the future. Oh, this is the question that um, I'm often, often asked. Are weeds useful for us, um, for our wildlife? Um, so just a couple of examples. I mean, that all the plants that we call weeds are really just white flowers. Um, they might not be native, so we have to make the distinction between, you know, native, not native. Uh, but a lot of our non-native, for example, the one behind me here, that plant behind me is not native, but it's very useful to wildlife. Um, and also we have to think that it's not only when the plants are in flower. Um, so often people think, well, the plant has finished flowering, so I can just cut it. But actually, um, you know, many, for example, butterflies and moth, where they need, they need the leaves, not the flowers, because they need their caterpillars and the larvae to be able to grow. So if you don't, you know, nettle, for example, is, is a really good example. I'll show that later. Uh, plants can also absorb pollution, something, you know, that we, we're not aware of. Um, but in cities, um, they might have an impact. Some very early research um, shows that they actually have an impact on air quality in our cities. Um, they make trees healthier. So when you have, like here in the tree pit, where you've got plants growing, uh, they might be able to retain some moisture and make the trees, you know, more uh, likely to survive and, and healthier. They could be a source of new medicines. Um, so this is something, you know, we often forget that many of actually of our medicines, even though they're now um, synthetic, but many of our medicines have come from plants uh, from all around the world. And including here, you know, it's not only about plants from the Amazon, some of our very common plants have actually uh, given us, you know, um, medicines and remedies. 
well, they help people discover nature. You know, pavement plants and things like that, and urban plants in general are so use are so easy to you know to look for. You don't need a garden. You just need to go out in the street and and have a look at what you'll see. And some of them can be really pretty too. <laughs> so just a few example. This is quite a pretty one, which is a trailing bellflower, um, and this is a very very good plant for bees. Um, so you often see them, you know, foraging and and um, and going in the flower, in the middle of the flowers. Um, left, you've got plantain. Um, so I was talking about, you know, pollution absorp absorption, um, and plantain has been shown to remove heavy metals. Um, so if you've got a very busy street, um, actually they may be, they, they, they are able to catch some of the, the heavy metals coming from the engine, you know. So it can be quite useful, potentially quite useful in some areas. Um, here we've got a small nettle, um, and nettle is, is a disliked plant because it stings, it's not particularly pretty, but it's actually the food plant for over 20 species of moth and butterfly. So if you can, for example, if you've got a garden, you know, leaving an area of nettles could be massively useful to wildlife. And finally, the last one here is pyrotera, or pelletry of the war. Um, and this is an important medicinal plant. Um, there, 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 there are studies, you know, going on about its medicinal properties. Um, and so something that looks, you know, not particularly attractive could actually be a really useful plant to us as humans as well as to wildlife. Um, so my question, my next question is, can we learn to live with them? Can we stop calling, you know, all plants that we see in the street weeds and just, you know, learn to live with let them a bit more? So around Europe, there's been initiatives to let plants live. Um, so, I mean, the two pictures here right in France, but there are also initiatives in, in Belgium, in Switzerland, in, in Germany. Um, so there are initiatives going on. Um, in France, um, glyphosate was banned in 2017 in public spaces. So we've started, you know, to see plants growing back, um, like here, and, um, and some cities have actually decided to turn this around and teach people why weeds are useful, which I think is amazing. Um, so they've, you know, they've, they've stopped using weed killer, you've got plants growing, and they're telling people, you know, those plants are actually useful to us for all the, the reasons I've quoted before. They're useful to us, they're needed by our wildlife. So shouldn't we try to accept them a bit more? In the UK, sadly, about 98% of councils still use weed killer, but change is happening slowly, but it's happening. Um, so I've, 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 I've been making a little map, you know, of progress and places in the country where things are changing. Um, and people are, you know, getting more rare as well. So I've just posted here, you know, some screenshots from tweets, um, you know, someone asking not to spray in their streets, um, putting a little signboard. Um, so, you know, there are ways to act, small ways to act, raise awareness with, you know, local councillors, things like that, um, just to make them understand, you know, what could be done. So I created More Than Weeds earlier this year um, because I wanted to change people's perception of street flora. Um, so I started, for example, writing plant names with chalk on the streets um, and also, you know, posting on social media, giving talks. Um, so my, my idea really is to um, make people learn to love weeds um, and possibly, you know, even use them in their parks or gardens. So sometimes, you know, people say, oh, this is a really pretty weed. Could I use it in my containers, for example? Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the real issue here is we shouldn't be, you know, saying this plant is a weed. A weed is it's a human name. It's a human term. You know, it's a construct. Um, a plant might, you know, just be a white flower in someone's garden and someone else think, oh, this is not really good. I don't want that. So, you know, I, I want people to think about what weeds are, what they think is a weed as well, um, and reflect on that. Um, so how you can help? When I've already said, you know, if you've got a garden, you can live a little bit in, in um, a wide area with weeds and white flowers for insects. Um, but if you don't have a garden or if you like, you know, walking in the street and you notice plants, um, if you're struggling to identify it, you know, I often get emails, people saying, I don't know what it is. Um, well, there are plenty of tools available, so don't panic. Um, so you can use um, websites like iSpot. Um, so it's a really uh, friendly, user-friendly website. You just post a picture with the location and people around the world will with, with reply to you with suggestions. 
Um, you can use guides. There are quite a few, um, you know, white flower books. Um, some of them are color based. So you just look for a, a flower color. Um, other ones are more, a bit more scientific. So you need a bit more, you know, botanical knowledge. Um, but there are all sorts of books available. And finally, if you're on social media, I really recommend an initiative called White Flower Hour. So it's on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and you can just um, send a picture of your plant and you'll get a botanist usually reply within a few minutes um, telling you, you know, what your plant is and stories and things like that. So it's quite exciting. Um, however, it's not the end. Um, so as I said before, it's very important to record, um, you know, the plants that you find because it helps scientists. I mean, it helps ecologists, it helps scientists um, to, to track how plants are, are changing, how they're evolving. So for example, the lovely harebell, which you can see here, has been declining in the UK because meadows are disappearing. Um, so, you know, it's a common plant. It, it used to be a common plant, but in the future, it might become even less and less. So we have to know, you know, what happens and, and how, they, how they change. And even for common plants, you know, I was talking about nettles. It might not be, you know, it's not a rare plant, but it could be interesting to actually track how it's moving. And so once your plant is recorded, it will be entered into a national database. Um, and then you can, you know, create maps and things like that. Um, so scientists can use it. So recording sounds complicated, but it's not. Um, it can be done online. So the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland has got a little form on their website. So you just put your name, your email, um, where you found the plant and what its name is, and that's it. Um, otherwise, you could use one of the uh, phone application. Um, so this is very easy. Um, it's just a, an, a phone application called iRecord. And it's the same you know, principle. Um, it will locate you, or you can just enter the location where you found the plant. You just enter its name, um, enter the date, your name, and that's it. Um, and the really good thing with applications like iRecord is you can have a history of you know, all the plants you've seen, um, so, for example, you know, if you start getting interested into urban, urban plants, you can see how the plants are changing um, over a year or try to find the plants that you found, you know, previously, things like that. So I think, you know, those tools um, are really useful because they can, you know, get you involved into, into botany and, you know, think you are contributing to um, our botanical knowledge in the, in the UK um, in a very simple way. You can do that, you know, with your children. Um, it's very easy to use um, and it can, you know, teach them a little bit about nature as well, urban nature. Um, so thank you very much for listening to my talk. As I said, within a few minutes, um, I will be live for a Q&A session. So if you have questions, um, please feel free to, uh, to ask them then. Um, if you're not able to stay, um, you can also have a look at my website and um, email me uh, with questions. Um, I'm very happy to reply to all questions about weeds and botany in general. So thank you very much for your attention.